now that I'm shrinking, remember how they say when you get older you shrink? <laughs> I saw those hands when she asked, has it been crazy? Has it, what's it been like to get here? And is it kind of nice? I thought, oh, if I'm supposed to start around 8, everybody's going to fall asleep. But it's like I almost feel rejuvenated. Just thank you for the precious worship. And your testimony was just so um, amazing. And, and just totally the strength of the Lord for you to get up there, right? And, and what a testimony. And I want to thank um, Valerie for even asking. She did. She came and told the Christmas story to our women. I was going to ask the girls, but I didn't want to interrupt worship. I think it's 10 Christmas stories we've had, 10 years. And um, it's beautiful because each year a different woman comes in and tells the Christmas story. It's our once-a-year Christmas um, women's Christmas outreach. And... Um, like Valerie said, we just got to chat and just share all kinds of things. I want to share some other things with you that's happened since then. But um, it's a, just to walk in and to see all the love and all the hospitality. And we know, and I've got some of the team here, we know all the work that went into this. And it's beautiful. And so we want to say thank you to all you ladies that made this happen tonight. We do know what you've done. And, and I love that your men pray as well during this time. We have a prayer team um, for us um, for this weekend as well and friends from all over. And I believe with all my heart that we were called here tonight together. I did. I grew up in Southern California. And when I came out here, one of the promises God gave me was, for the solitary man, I will give you a family. And he did. You know, the family of God's amazing. Like, I already feel so loved by you because we're family. And he placed um, me. I left family and grew up, at, in, like I said, in Southern California and came out here. And, and right now I'm so blessed because he's placed me in a very precious family on the Jersey Shore. <laughs> but isn't it neat, like when we went to Vineland and we got to meet, and we've already been able to meet some of you here, and it's like because we're family. And isn't that comfort your heart? I mean, so many people are so lonely, but we have family. So if any of you are those kind of women that do church and you're in and you're out, just like, um, is it Blay? Is that how you say it? Blay, just I really understand, you know, really related to what you're saying is like so many people miss that we are a family. It's about coming in to wherever God's placed you. He's got a home for you and um, just wants to show himself so faithful and show us how much he loves us um, by connecting together. And what beautiful. I mean, I love all your artwork and all the gifts and all of that. Did I'm sure all of you got um, an invitation, right? Did any of you read it? It was pretty clever, that little question. Um, do you remember reading the invitation? Well, I'm going to read it to you. <laughs> Valerie wrote down on here, how would our lives be changed if we would learn what it means to be still and know that he is God? And for those of you that did see it, um, did you think about that? Um, it was a good question to ask. It was a challenging question to ask. And um, quite frankly, I think it changes everything when you actually learn still. And um, that obviously we even are, have already been able to hear the passage. And I have to say it's been kind of a fun, challenging thing to sit on this passage because there's three of us are going to unfold this one verse. <laughs> And I was so excited about it that when she asked, I, I just sat down and I just, I had an outline for every one of them. And I'm not sure if I knew which one I was doing at that time, but I was so excited about it. And then um, Valerie said, will you do Be Still? So I was so excited and I wrote this message and I shared it with my husband. I love my husband. He is just a gentle giant. I mean, like, um, 
And by the way, yes, we fell in love in Sunday school, and he said I took his breath away, but now he can't get a word in edgewise. <laughs> <laughs> he's 6'3", and so when he's on his knees, we see eye to eye. But uh, we are totally, you know, talk about God using opposites in every area of our life, from the pace that we go to the height that we are, but we both love Jesus. And so I feel very comfortable asking him. So I shared with him the message, and he goes, it's really good, Candace, but you're in the know. You've got a lot of the know in there. I was so excited about this place called Still that I just wanted you to know all the reasons why it's so wonderful. So... Um, sorry, Lori, wherever you are. I went back, and I had to be more still just to sit on this passage. I'm uh, tipping um, 70 now, and I'm still hyper. And so I just grew up a hyper person, and still is not exactly in my makeup. So I have learned what still is. And i got to tell you that the passage, Be Still, and know that I am God is so rich and such a treasure that I hope that you will continue to just be still and really hear even now. I know that it took, takes a lot to get out of town and to get here and to, uh, I don't know how far you've driven or it doesn't matter if you're 10 minutes away trying to get the kids settled and the husband happy and the, just all of the things that just happen to sidetrack us. But one of the things I love about retreats is it's a time to pull out, isn't it? A time to slow down. It's a time out, but it's a time to be still and, like Bree said, breathe. And we wonder why we enjoy these retreats, but you know, we can experience this every day. We can have the same kind of a, a, a blessing when, when we learn that place of still. If ever this summons to be still was suited for us, it is it's so now. We are living in crazy, crazy times. Now, I remember asking pa Pastor Chuck. I grew up at Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, got saved in the hippie days. And I remember when I thought he was an old man, <laughs> which is probably way back when he was 50 or something. But um, in that, uh, I remember saying to him, Pastor Chuck, have things changed a lot since you were younger? And if you know who he is, his answer was, oh, yes. <laughs> it has. But boy, ramp it up. It is such a crazy culture today. He's in heaven. He, he would, I don't know if he, he and Kay would know what to do with today. So, well, they would because they know Jesus. But is it? <laughs> I keep moving it around. I'm sorry. Um, anyway, we are living in crazy times. The narrative, of t um, the, the narrative today is the last day's dilemma. I mean, the Lord told us about it in 2 Timothy 3, what this was going to look like. But you know what? It's so surrealistic. I mean, he told us it was going to happen. It's happening, and we're going, can you believe that? And it reminds me in the book of Acts when every time, you know, the Spirit of God was moving and the, and the disciples would say, oh. It's just like the scripture said. It's just what Jesus said. And that's kind of what's happening today, isn't it? It's just crazy, crazy times. And it's a crazy time because we're living in a post-Christian world today, a post-everything world today. And what that means is that the people have chosen to leave God out of the equation of our life today. And I was speaking to this young lady the other day, and and um, I said, you know, when I was a little girl, we read our, uh, in California even. California is a whole different place than I grew up too. Um, but we read our Bible, we prayed, and, and the girl goes, were you in a Catholic school? And I said, no, well, I'm talking public school. <laughs> and I said, ever since he's been taken out of the schools, and as we all know, if we watch, listen, you know, observing our history in our country, the more he has been taken out and we've become a humanistic culture, the crazier it is, the crazier it has been. So we're just like ramped up on restless people today. I mean, it is so ramped up and we are so restless. We're always in a hurry, always in a hurry, rush, no time, don't have enough time. I mean, have you even gotten sucked into that? Have you ever heard yourself saying that? 
Um, and loud, the world is so loud today. It is so loud. And so much noise, the ringtones, the, the, the whistles, the bells. I even know people who, who don't even like that solitude. They're so used to noise that they'll turn their TV on all day long because they just feel like they don't want to be lo uh, alone. It's almost like solitude and silence is hard for people to, to deal with. But um, I think it's even getting scarier in the point that it's so, we're so overwhelmed with so many voices that are trying to define who we are. Just we're told what we need. We're told what we, we will be, uh, what we should do if we're going to have any worth or just flat out defining us. And what it's producing and what it's pumping out today is just agitated people, angst people, angry people, bitter people, almost with like this militant attitude, entitlement attitude. Um, it's like the social movement that's taking place, so busy connecting, and yet we are probably more disconnected in relationships than we've ever been, ever, in, in history. And it's just, again, it's left us broken and just worked, stretched, stressed. Um, I have a great a granddaughter. Well, she's my, I can call her that. She said, I'm her mama. My grandson married this precious um, girl, and she's a beautiful model, Ford model, and in the summers we go and visit the family, and so Araya was there, and then my other grandson has a girlfriend, and she's incredibly gorgeous, and she grew up in the Hollywood thing. Her father's a famous actor, so these two girls are in the world of beautiful, as the world says, and around what seems to be what the world would think was just the, the thing to do. And I, I said to them last summer, I said, in your sphere of influence, in your world, what is it that you hear the most from other girls? What, is, what are the issues they're dealing with? Now, I'm talking about two of the most gorgeous girls in the most beautiful kind of world. And they said, insecurity. They are so insecure, the group of girls that they know. And to look at them, and I even know that um, one young lady came to me one day from here, and she just said, sometimes I just get so depressed because on these Instagrams that I'm following, it's like, my favorite BFF, and you know, with their husbands, and this young lady's a new bride, and she's still trying to figure out marriage, and if anybody's been married long enough, you know what I'm talking about. And or my baby's not walking as fast as this baby, and just all the comparing ourselves, all the noise, all the loud, the, the loud voices that are coming into us. And we get to this place where it's almost with all this anxiety and fear and a hopelessness. Kids are finding themselves in hopeless places. Do you know that our centennials, which is the group of kids um, uh, that came came up behind the millennials. We have on record the highest record in history of suicide for kids. How can that be for kids? Not just for kids. I see a cultural deity taking place where even it, the world, in like Second Peter, we did that last year, how Paul's or Peter's heart was the fact that people were buying into a cultural deity. It's like creeping into the church today. And how can that be when God said, I've given you everything you need to thrive, not just to survive? And um, the thing that I love is that we who know the Lord don't have to leave him out of the equation. We need to bring him into the equation of everything, no matter how loud it is, how many voices are there? Because God has a remedy for restlessness. And it's like somebody else mentioned, it's not what you do, it's just to be. Just to be in a place called still. I actually, since mine was still, um, that's what I titled this message, is a place called still. And we're going to talk about where it's not, where it is, some roadblocks and detours
that could stop us from getting to still and how to get to still. And um, because we get to this place where the question is, how do I navigate this thing called life in such a crazy, confusing culture? And so uh, I think the place we need to realize is where it's not. Start with that, because it's absolutely the opposite direction of still. Um, is the word restless. It's the opposite of still. So I looked it up in the dictionary. And I want us just, I wasn't going to read all the words, but I want us to. I want us to be still and to hear. Because I want you to, to examine your own heart. And if the Spirit of God, the quiet Spirit of God, begins to put his finger on that area, just hold on to that. Not to beat yourself up with, but do you want to learn steel? I mean, look at that. And I was amazed at your journal. You know, when you do spend, she was spending time in, with the Lord in that still place. And then he began to, to work out the greater reality and the truth of who he really is in her life. And she could go back and say, you were in my midst. You were in my midst. One of the things that I noticed in this passage was that three times you hear the word selah in these 11 verses. So three times in 11 verses. And that word means listen. Just slow down and listen. And I believe he wants us to hear from him tonight. And as we slow down and hear these things, and you probably see us all overlapping a little bit. That's okay. Because sometimes it takes a lot more times than that just to, to just get it to sink in, but he wants us to hear it. But restless, according to the dictionary, is agitated, anxious, fear-driven, nervous, tense, distracted, discouraged, disquieted, discontent, distressed, depressed, defeated, uneasy, unsettled, doubt, and always in worry. And I was thinking, for those of us that follow Jesus, can you even imagine a stressed out Jesus? <laughs> Although there's a lot of people who call themselves Christians, and they, 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 like we've always been <laughs> called it, just baptized in, in lemon juice, just, you know, in this place. And it's like, well, who would want to sign up for that? And we, um, anyway, I just threw that one in. <laughs> Ask yourself, what place are you in? Is that where you're living? Is that your mantra? So here's where it is. And it's the place you must go if you want to find the place called still. It's to not move, not to make a sound. It's to be quiet, to be hushed. It's calm, and it's rest, and it's peace. It kind of has the whole idea of taking your hands off and relaxing your grip just to let it go. And that song keeps sticking in my head. I've never even seen the movie, but let it go. Um, <laughs> that Disneyland thing. Um, <laughs> it's kind of like stop trying to fight your own battles. Stop trying to work it out. It's a absolute place of surrender, whether you've got barf on you or you, uh, wherever you are, where we're called the still, it's a complete surrender. And I remember hearing a, a, a pastor's wife uh, one day say, it's like, just keep open hands. It's a place of full surrender. It's a position of heart. And... Um, but to be still is not a passive thing. 
it's an act of humility and putting your trust in God. And I'm sure, Bree, that's exactly how you pictured it. I, you, you, pr you presented it. It was such a good picture of seeing you just open hands. And we don't have to be in always that desperate place to be there. That's just a daily, because we are listening to so many voices, and we are pulled in so many directions. But um, to be still is to bring, um, to put ourselves into the presence of God. It's to put ourselves into the presence of God. It's a holy place. It's to, to bring him into the equation of our all things everywhere all the time. It's what we were made for. <laughs> it's communion with the creator, that intimate time at the depths of our heart touching him. And I keep thinking of that song. I don't sing, so mine will come out real cracky, but you'll get the point. It's just like, have you ever heard the old song, Glory came down and heaven filled my soul. That's what it is when you are still. And I have to be careful that I don't get into the no. <laughs> but it's the safest place we can be is in this place called still. This kind of divine uh, unity produces a quiet heart. But you've got to understand that those loud noises are coming in and all kinds of things are happening and there are some warnings that we need to heed if we ever want to make it to still. Who wouldn't want to go to still? Listen to these testimonies. Listen to the precious words that were sung. And you're going to hear tomorrow all kinds of reasons why that you're going to want to go there. But there are roadblocks and detours um, that will keep you from getting to this place called still. There's an, uh, an enemy of our soul. There's three enemies of our soul. The, and the, they, I'm going to share a couple of tactics but they have the same goal, and that's to try to sabotage you from finding this place or ever living in that place called still. The first place is duty without devotion. If you're just doing church or even doing your devotions or doing your homework, Valerie, I'm sure you can relate that when people, uh, when we have women study, we go into the student mode, don't we? Girls love school and like the student mode. And so it breaks my heart when people say, oh, I didn't come because I didn't do my homework. But that is not the point of homework. And I started calling them devotionals to maybe, it, 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 I tried. <laughs> but the thing is, um, if you just do church, do your devotionals, you're zipping in and zipping out, um, it's just a heady thing and not a heart thing. The Lord told us in James 4, 8, draw close to me and I will draw close to you. It's a promise. And... Um, it's a place where we just, I love when he told us in uh, Proverbs 22, 20, 23, 26, he says, the Lord says, give me your heart and watch me have my way with you. He just wants our heart. And the second place that will be a total block from being ever making it to the place called still is unchecked, an unchecked heart. Sin separates us from God and it builds a wall. Just like any relationship. You know when, you, when you're having a tete-a-tete -tete with your spouse? <laughs> Until you've kind of, re, you know, confessed and made right with one another, and then there's fresh air. And the relationship just can continue to carry on. So mind your checks. Um, because things like anger winds up turning into unforgiveness, which makes us a bitter old woman. And... It, we will never get to the place called still. If we have adopted the what we call um, my mama K, my pastor's wife, um, used to say, if you've ever adopted the Eve mentality, you don't want to go there. The Eve mentality is, I know what's better for me than God does. And God says it's very important to um, mind our checks and confess our sins and forsake our sins so that he can cleanse us, just that daily cleansing and staying close. Um, but the one I want to sit on for a little bit longer is the big busy. Does anybody know the big busy? <laughs> um, there actually is something, did you know, that there's actually something they call now hurry sickness? 
the, the, the world is even recognizing, this world is getting so ramped up and things are happening that they call it hurry sickness. Um, years ago, m my mothers in the faith who, who taught us about prayer called it busy as an acronym, B-U-S-Y, being under Satan's yoke. You're totally not living in freedom. You are not living in steel, but you're, but you're just, it's a heavy yoke. It's not the yoke that the Lord said. Jesus said, you take my yoke upon you. That's the place of steel and rest. Otherwise, we just put this yoke of iron on ourselves because we're hearing all these voices that tell us what to do so that we'll be somebody. And, and even I know ladies who have gotten cup, caught up in busy is their identity. Look at me. I'm the PTA mom, and I'm the this mom, and the little league mom, and, the, and I'm not saying any of these things are wrong in, it, in and of themselves, but when you get caught up in saying, I can do that, I can do that, I can do that, and you just get so heavy laden um, with your busy, it's toxic. Hurry is toxic. It's the great enemy of our soul, and we need to recognize that that's part of what busy is happening. It robs us from the capacity to experience the moment. The moment. Um, I, to experience the presence of God. Remember when Jacob was just kind of asleep to everything that was going on around him? And he woke up and he goes, oh, God was here and I didn't even know it. And um, do you realize he's in your midst? Do you know how many times... In, this, in these 11 verses, he said, I'm in your midst. I'm with you. I'm here for you. I've got this. Read this passage. It's amazing. Um, did you know that? I had to look this up because I thought, that sounds crazy. But did you know that it is said that we as adults make 35,000 decisions a day? 35,000. I thought, I looked at my notes and I thought, I better look this up again. I put 3,500. And I thought that was a lot. But um, it's left us with what they call now decision fatigue. So now we've got hurry sickness out there and decision fatigue. <laughs> and when the, but it's in the church too. <laughs> so we're so stretched and stressed at, that it's taxing even our health. I love what a pastor said one time, that the, we're made up of body, soul, and spirit. We're fearfully and wonderfully made. And it is said that the body and the soul live so closely together, it often catches one another's disease. I wound up with Epstein-Barr as well. And I know it was a result of hurry. I know that my life was so ramped up, my body couldn't take it any longer. So it's working us, ladies. And it's not just physically, but emotionally. Look at all the, the, the problems people are having, and spiritually. We're robbing ourselves from knowing that he is God. Um, I heard it once said, hurry is a form of violence on the soul, and we must re ruthlessly eliminate busy from our life. Ruthlessly, We need to be understanding what's going on to us so that we're not just letting life run over us. Because God said, no, you just be still. You show up. He'll, show, he'll do the rest. Thank you for singing that song, wherever Lisa is. Uh, um, that, that it's like, turn your eyes upon Jesus. You know, when we are still and we just turn our eyes upon Jesus, he does the work. It's a, it's a work of the Spirit. It's not what we're doing. It's just where we be. Be very close to him. And definitely, we need to understand that if you're too busy for Jesus, you are too busy. And if you're note-taking, I would definitely write that down. If you are too busy for Jesus... You are too busy. And that's a lesson I learned a long time ago. 
But what I did learn about busy and being still is it is a learned thing, especially if you're a hyper person. But you know, you can even be a quiet person on the outside and very active on the inside. But being as hyper as I am, I started talking to my lovely husband about this. And we were talking about, um, since I've been here, if we get out <laughs> from anywhere, he drives. And we call our streets freeways, and we live in Cement City. So I think it's absolutely gorgeous to be on the parkways. It's like driving through a park. <laughs> it's gorgeous. But I enjoy it, and it's beautiful, and we just saw peaks of um, uh, fall coming down here. We don't have it quite yet. Um, but if you were to ask me to go and drive wherever we've been several times, because I'm dee -dee 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 with Bill and kind of looking around, kind of, and um, or finishing work on a cell phone, um, I get so distracted I could never get to that place on my own again. And I miss so much of the beauty around me. Now, we live in Red Bank. And it's a whole different thing when you're walking, isn't it? You, you kind of experience a lot more. Um, although, <laughs> because I'm a point A to point B kind of person, and we're in a very old little township, I trip all the time. Because the sidewalks are like this. Because I'm like going from, from our house to the, to the river. Now, we have a friend that comes and visits us once a year. And that's kind of our thing as we go for a walk down to the river. And she's much more of an observer. So she's looking and taking videos of cherry blossoms and things that I've just missed because I was going from A to B. I did see a lot more. I smelled a lot more of the environment and all that but than driving. But still, um, I mean, to the point where this is kind of embarrassing, but... We park our car in the backyard, okay? And you just, every year, for the last 17 years, I park the car. I, will, I walk only across the sidewalk where our barbecue is. I think you call it a grill here. And, um, and on the deck and in the, ba in, the pa in the house. Every day. Every day I walk past that. And one day it dawned on me that the barbecue wasn't out there. So I came in to, and said to Bill, well, where's the barbecue? And he goes, well, I put it away about a month ago. And I, and I thought, oh, Lord, how many times do I just zip through my day? And you're in my midst, and I missed you. I don't want to miss you. Teach me to slow down. In fact, that was one of the solutions that the people in the world that know about um, hurry sickness and, and uh, decision fatigue, their answer is to learn to slow. They're teaching people to slow. And I need Jesus to teach me to slow. How can you, how can you walk by the same barbecue and not even see it? I can. But oh, when I sit on that deck. I love to sit on my deck. Being from Southern California, you live outside all the time. Now you have little windows. And every time we have any weather that's out there, I sit on that deck. And I talk to Chipper. Every squirrel that comes around is chipper. <laughs> and you can hear the birds. And isn't there something beautiful about experiencing the presence of what season he's given us? Like just about there. Can you? Because you've got more fall here now than I. I can't quite smell it or feel it yet. But you know when fall comes, don't you? You experience that when you sit so much more. You can hear the birds, see the leaves changing, and, and, and the, all the colors from the palette that, are, that God has. And you can experience so much more. And it's a learned thing, learning to slow down and be still. There's going to be the times, and I believe, like, it seems like there's so many more things we could talk about with still. Um, because I believe that when you learn still in the closet, you'll learn still in the crowd. And what I mean by that is a still thing should be a daily. It's, it's what will, you know, it, it should be a daily um, place that we go. 
And when you recognize his voice and you see his ways, you'll recognize that when you're out in the, I call it the closet because Jesus said, come and meet with me in the secret place. And the King James, it's the word closet. So I always say in the, you learn it in the closet and you'll hear him and you'll recognize it and you know where to go in the crowd when things get tough. So I thought that I would share just a few ways that I get to still. So take it from a hyper old lady. <laughs> These are not, this is not a method or a recipe but they're definitely essentials. And what I mean by that is every one of these things should be in the equation of that still quiet time, but it, maybe it'll go in different order. Um, but it does have to start with a heart that's intentional to make him your first love, to keep him your first love. There is great promise for those at Matthew 6.33, which is letting him be first in everything. Um, so to be with Jesus is where we find still, and we were wired for this kind of love, created to have communion with the lover of our soul, um, the great I am, the one who delights in being with us. And if we would just go and be with him, he'll still our soul. He'll still our heart. So a goal without a plan is never going to happen. It isn't a random thing. He shows us all through the scriptures. Jesus taught them about the secret place, his, his disciples. And it was a time to, it's a time where we invest in heaven and we receive the precious riches from the greater world, the kingdom of God. And so it's imperative that we find a quiet place, wherever that place is. Do you have a quiet place? Whatever it looks like for you today. And we do have seasons. I've been a mom. <laughs> you know, you, you're single and you have hours to be in your quiet place. You do. Know? And you can go anywhere you want. And then you get married. And you're 24-7 with another human. <laughs> and you're trying to figure out how you can go find a quiet place to be with the lover of your soul. And then you have babies. And that's another time you challenge. And when we moved out here, we lived in the mission house. And there was like, it was packed all the time. So I had my canvas bag and all my, my notebook, my Bibles and whatever. And every day I just have to figure out where I could go. Sometimes it was in the motorhome in the parking lot. But it's important to have a place where you have make a, a time to rendezvous with him. It's kind of saying... Um, you know, it just there's something exciting about finding that place to be with him. But you know what? Moses found still in the cleft of a rock. And he saw God's glory. Paul found still in the throne room, and he indulged in the Lord's grace. Daniel found still in his chambers. And that's where faith trumped fears. And John, well, he found still on an island... And Jesus revealed himself to him, and he told him the end of the story. There is the most amazing place is to go to the place called still. It's where our worries and our woes turn into worship, and we need to have a place. Find a place. Do you have a place? Mine was a bathtub at one time. <laughs> We were on a mission trip, and I, and, and I let, you know, I wanted Bill to be blessed with where the little desk and lamp was, and so I took a, the comforter and stuck myself in a dry uh, <laughs> bathtub, but find a place. You, you, you just need a place, and the next thing you need is to make the time. It's not going to happen if you don't book him in. Do you book him in? Now, that changes, too, um, but you're... Uh, the old way of thinking saying, I don't have time. I've heard a lot of women say, I don't have time to have my devotions. I've been too busy. haven't been able to do it. And it's robbed them from being able to get to that place called still. You cannot afford not to make time for him. He's going to make put hours in your days. You think, I can't do this. He's going to put hours in your days, give you strength you never imagine that you can have and we need to book him in just book him in it's actually saying i love you more do you love jesus and yet 
what's it like when you have a relationship and they're too busy for you and you're thinking, I thought you said that we were friends. I thought that you loved me and you're never around. Make the time for him. Sometimes it's going to mean you need to get up earlier. Just flat out means that. And sometimes Bill and I will get, you kind of have to reel yourself in. You have the intention to do it and you reel yourself in. And Bill and I have had to say more than once, we have to go to bed now so we can hurry up and get and breathe with him in the morning. <laughs> you know, we've had to go to bed early to get up with him in the morning. And I remember a time when we were, just had moved out there not, not long after, and it was crazy, and I realized I'm leaving still, and I need to find a place, and I need to get some time. So it's, this is still my favorite time, but I got up at 2 in the morning, and I thought, nobody needs me. Nobody needs me. And I get all cozy with my cup of tea, and the, and the phone rang <laughs> at 2 in the morning. And it's three hours difference in uh, time zone in California. And it was this young lady named Rachel, family friend of ours. And um, I know this sounds like California, but it's like, is this Candace? Or Rachel? She goes, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. She was young. And she goes, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. I thought this was the other Candace that she worked with. And I thought, boy, that's even late at home. <laughs> but you know what? It kind of, I had to laugh because I thought I had really gotten this down. I got up at 2 in the morning and nobody needed me. But again, it's still my favorite time because I can spend quiet with him and then go back to bed for a couple hours and get up for the day. That's my favorite thing. You find yours. Um, you're going to have to reel yourself in. But even if you only have a little bit of time, always remember little is much when he is in it. Little is much when he is in it. Now, when you get there, and anybody that's done this knows what I'm talking about. It times, takes time to get to still, especially if you're hyper like me. And what happens is there still seems to be distracted. Have you ever noticed when you finally decide, I'm going to start having my own quiet time? And all of a sudden, that wicker chair that's been hanging in your garage for years, <laughs> you start thinking about how important it is that it gets painted and reupholstered. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? That just happens, doesn't it? I remember also years ago, Pastor Chuck used to tell us that um, because I'm a task-oriented person, it was like, I need to call so-and-so. And all of a sudden, all the people and all the tasks you need to do start to, start to have this conversation with you. And he told me, or told me, he was talking to me, he was from the pulpit. <laughs> but just keep a piece of paper next to you and just write it down. And then just go back to what you're doing. It takes time. Andrew Murray, and if you've never read him, anything, he's old. He's old you know, it's an old, old book uh, from the 1800s. But anytime you can read anything of his, it, you'll have to be still to understand it at first because <laughs> of the language. But he called it a readying up time. It takes time to ready your heart up to connect with the unseen world, to see the greater world. But just give it time. And one of the practical ways also is just disk the devices. <laughs> you know, they just beckon your call, don't they? <laughs> um, so um, get rid of the devices, write it down, and just keep dialing in. Now, one of the things that I love to do, and I cannot sing. Nobody's ever asked me to be on the worship team. <laughs> but I like to just sing to the Lord. And... Um, I remember reading in, um, in Hezekiah when things were just, um, um, the enemy was surrounding them and it was loud and it, they, they were just being um, invaded. God said to him, call out the singers. And they did. And they began to sing and it says the enemy ambushed themselves. You know, the enemy can, uh, the Lord inhabits the praises of his saints. You're bringing him into your presence. It's practicing the presence of God. And again, I can't sing, but just sing. Did you know that we're called to minister to the Lord? In Ezekiel 33, 16, it says, come and minister to the Lord. He loves just to have that, that, that communion together. There's fullness of joy in the presence of the Lord. And I always bring my Bible. It's his love letter. It's his love letter. And I read it. 
and I read it with a listening ear and a listening heart. One word from him will anchor our soul and bring us comfort in this crazy world. In Deuteronomy 32, it says that his word is our very life. And when we feed on his word, it nourishes our soul and gives us rest and peace. And out of that comes a time of thanksgiving. The overflow of that is a time of thanksgiving. It's um, in Psalm 119, 164. It's like at, oh, at the end of that chapter, which is a long chapter, and it's all about how precious the word of God is, how important the word of God is, how powerful the word of God is, how comforting. And, and he just says, I will praise you seven times a day, Lord. Because the psalmist knew how great it was to be alone with him and to feed on his word. And when we sit there and we begin to trace the goodness and the grace of God, it just brings life to your soul. It brings life to your soul. When we feed on his faithfulness, it'll be the fodder for our future faith. And it makes for a merry heart. And a merry heart makes like medicine. And it makes us healthy. It actually affects our health. In verse 8, in this chapter, it says that when we're in this place called still, we're called to behold. And behold is a wow word. It's like something remarkable for you to look at. And I was thinking that um, when we remember our God and we think about the things that he has done, it just brings a peace on us. And there is no greater work than the cross at Calvary, that kind of love. And the cross of Christ where we see Jesus, our Savior, our hero, our deliverer, the one who loves you with an everlasting love. Doesn't that give you rest for your soul? Just to think about it. So behold, when you're still, behold. Look at what he's done. Amy Carmichael said, if you look around you, you'll get distressed. If you look within you, you'll get depressed. But when you keep your eyes on Jesus, you'll keep your rest. And just continue to be still. It's kind of like be still, continually still. When you learn to practice the presence of the Lord, it will make your soul still and it will spoil you for the ordinary. When you go to the place called still and you will realize that he is much more than you ever expected and everything you need. And I, I know that most of you know him and you've been to still. Maybe you've left that place. Maybe you've never been to that place. Maybe you don't know him yet to know that place. But I believe, like when Moses said, I want to see your glory, God said, come, there's a place by me. And in Isaiah, I just always see this picture in Isaiah 30, 18. It's like God's outstretched arms with his huge love for you and his nail-pierced hands saying, please come. I am just waiting for you to wait on me that I might do good and gracious things for you. And that promise, those promises um, the life of rest is a promise for the child of God, and he doesn't have favorite daughters. This is a place all of us can go. But um, I was going to, I asked um, Valerie if she would come and share what that means, because maybe you've never been to Still, maybe you're not his daughter. But um, thank you for letting me share my 48 years of having to learn this and still learn it, because <laughs> I'm hyper. But you can go to steel.